Japan or you followed fashion, you probably know that Japan has um, some notable fashion styles in the past. And even now, uh, Japan has a little bit of a reputation for being like a fashion, uh, a fashionable place. Like people there dress well in general, or at least that's the image. Um, I will say if you're like in Tokyo, you're just going to see a lot of black suits <laughs> of businessmen. But besides that, when you don't see a black suit, it's might be someone really standing out. Um, so some of the past styles of Japanese fashion, they might be flamboyant and gaudy and really trying to, to grab attention. Uh, and those are less common now than in maybe like the early 2000s, 90s, and the 80s, and probably the 70s as well, certain um, styles. And But now they're, those are rare subcultures that you see less often. And the the modern kind of everyday style of, of Japan today is kind of like a, a very modest streetwear kind of thing. A lot of baggy clothes, um, flowy stuff, a lot of layers. That's uh, generally what people wear. And even in the summer, people go for something like that. Not a lot of um, like shorter stuff, really. It's, it's, people usually dress very modestly. Um, welcome. Hi. There's okay. a hand out there, Cyrus. Oh, here. I'll do one of these. Here. I'll give her mine. I'll oh, give her yes. mine. You have a notification on WebEx, I think, or Zoom. Um, I'll just listen. <laughs> they text the messaging. I think it is a do you want to leave the meeting? So I said no. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, I'll have some pictures on the next slide, but some of these styles are uh, Lolita is a style of a fashion style in Japan. There's also Gyaru, uh, Bosuzoku, and several different kinds of styles under the general genre of K, K E I. Uh, so we'll see what those look like. Here we go. So you can see the top row is kind of what I'm talking about with the subcultures. These are fashion that's a lot more flashy and they've each had their kind of decade of prime time. Uh, and now they're more so uh, kind of seen only in niche places. You could go to a cafe or something where they specifically dress like this to see it. Or you'd have to go into like the specific neighborhood of Tokyo where this style still has a strong presence. So you can see here, it's the Lolita fashion. They There's sub like variants of these. Obviously there's like goth Lolita or like pastel Lolita, all kinds of stuff. Um, and this is kind of it's like Victorian era clothing and is what is the inspiration there. So they go for really dresses that bump out. Um, is that based on the novel Lolita? I don't think so. <laughs> Yeah, it, it means it means something else in Japanese, not something better specifically, but something else. Uh, and uh, but they, that's generally what that um, style is called. The second one here is Gyaru. Uh, I believe that one was bigger in like the late 80s and early 90s of like kind of big hair, um, what do you call it? leg warmers um, and, and like heavy tanning and, and heavy makeup. So that was uh, a style that is still kind of, you might see it represented a little bit uh, in, in people, but like more muted down. But if you were to go to Harajuku, you might see someone combining the general Harajuku street style with something else. So you might see like Harajuku uh, Lolita, Harajuku Gyaru. Uh, and the third picture here, that is uh, more of a male style. It's Bosuzoku. And that one is inspired by like motorcycle and street gangs of Japan in like, I'm trying to think where it comes from the like post seventies, I think around there it's like sixties and seventies and maybe the eighties as well. Um, so this is the, the fashion style. Bosuzoku is also a bit of a lifestyle that includes having a really tricked out motorcycle, like huge fenders, flashing lights, air horns, everything. So, uh, and you might still see that today. I know I have uh, an American friend who in Japan, he got 
like uh, close friends with a bunch of Bolsozoku people, and they would invite him to go with them, still driving their big motorcycles from like the 70s, uh, you know, dressing like that. And I think before it used to be like street gangs, kind of uh, like, you know, actually kind of organized crime kind of the Yakuza? Uh, idea, a little bit, yeah, a little bit <laughs> like that, like, well, it was like the Yakuza was like, you know, the adults and these were the little boys. They oh. were just <laughs> messing around, driving motorcycles, yeah. The delinquent still like a, mm. a type. I think so. I think delinquent takes a little bit from Bosozoku where they've got big hair. They have a certain style of like clothing. This isn't delinquent. Delinquent, if you can imagine the third one, but mm. less colorful. Mm. Maybe just like playing in um, um, black uniforms. uniforms. Okay. Usually they would these are like modified yeah. uniforms is what they're wearing, you know, to show that they're rebelling against. Yeah. Just for reference, Tokyo Avengers is all about. Right. Yeah, and Tokyo Avengers is a combination. There's Bosuzoku, and then I guess well, no, and then they get older and they're like regular organized crime, right? They're like not in that style, but yeah, the delinquent is is also a. Probably a less flashy version of the Bosozoku. Uh, and then the fourth one there on the top row, that's like visual K or there's a lot of different genres of K. Uh, but that's kind of going for an edgier look, you know, long hair, <laughs> big bangs, colorful, well, colorful, not very colorful. And then, you know, lots of layers, lots of chains. It's a, a different style. Like our there. punk rock look here. Right. Yes. Punk rock. Okay. That's a good idea. That's a good Way to describe it. Metal. So you can see off the first four, there's a lot of variation in the styles kind of throughout the decades uh, of Japan. And, you know, in certain areas of Tokyo, you will still get to see these, uh, even if it's maybe just someone cosplaying it and not kind of fully in the the lifestyle, really. Mm -hmm. Or you could see some people that are really like authentically uh, expressing themselves in this way. Uh, and I think it's just very interesting to see how uh the difference between how we, we might see Japanese society of they're very like you know rule followers and they don't like to stand out very much to you see this um really like stand out fashion and it comes from you know it's like the flip side of that society where people don't like to stand out much but when they want to express themselves and feel individual they're going to do it in a bigger way in a flashier way to get so go big or go home Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Everything to be extreme. Uh, and then here at the bottom, you might. This is what you might see now as just average street fashion in Tokyo. Probably the same as you'd see in a lot of places around the world. But just you know, layers, baggier stuff, hoodies, uh, bomber jackets, stuff like that. It's my style. <laughs> it's very comfortable. It's yes. very comfortable. That's the the main goal right now. I think that's like where currently. The, the modern kind of every man's fashion is in, in Japan. This is being very comfortable. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, I have no notes. Okay. And uh, it, seasonal fashion, the seasons kind of change drastically and very quickly in Japan. So um, it's important to you know dress for the occasion. In this case, you guys are thinking of going in the summer. So we're, it's going to be hot and it's going to be humid. And uh, it'd be very important to dress accordingly for that. So, yes, you definitely want to be comfortable. Oh, also for shoes, you want to be comfortable in something you can wear all day long because there's you can use a lot of public transportation, but you might be standing, you might be walking from station to station. Uh, generally, my experience has been in Japan, you're going to, to do a lot more walking, like a ton more walking. So comfortable shoes are definitely important. And another note, on the shoes is you might want something that's very easy to take on and off because if you're going to um, traditional Japanese restaurants, a traditional Japanese uh, like inn, anything that's more traditional will usually involve you uh, taking off your shoes and like storing them in a locker and just going into that place without your shoes. Sometimes they'll offer slippers so you don't have to worry about like bringing any secondary shoes, but probably best to steer clear of like laced up boots you know it's, if it takes a while to, to put on and off uh it's you're really gonna feel that uh yeah it's definitely going to be 
you know, it could happen several times in a day. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Yes. It will. I, it depends. Yeah. If if it, if it is specifically in the monsoons or or the typhoons. Right. Yeah. I think generally like the like I got these shoes uh after no during Japan and they're just like slip ons mm -hmm. and it, as long as it's not really pouring down it's not going to be too you know you're not going to get wet or anything like that I will look into when the monsoon season is and like typhoons just to make sure you guys aren't going there because then yeah I might recommend like Crocs or something because it's going to get wet no matter what That's my thinking too, is like June for rainy season. Um, right, yeah, you definitely want something comfortable. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a thing where Japanese people are very used to just taking off shoes and it'll be any kind of shoe. And you'll see, you know, kind of like how like a little kid will put on their shoes, they'll just step into it and it, you know, it's all messed up on the back. And they don't care. Um, but just Japanese people do that because they've been used to it since school. Like in school, you have your outdoor shoes, you have your indoor shoes, you have different shoes for the gym because that's a different kind of indoor. And you have to carry those and you change them all, you know, three times a day. So they're just very used to it. Um, but if you're not used to that culture, it's probably good to get something that you know is kind of easy on and off and still comfortable for, for long walking. Um, talking about the seasons, actually, Japan, they love to say that Japan has four seasons. It's like a saying, people say it all the time. And I think they're, at this point, I've lost the meaning of it. Just Japan has four seasons. Obviously, every place has four seasons. Um, and I think they're trying to say Japan has like four distinct seasons of the year that, that represent different times of the year. And there's different like traditions and culture for each season. That's more like, I think, the meaning. Uh, in reality, Japan has like 16 tiny seasons and they all last just a few weeks. <laughs> right. It's it's crazy. It's and, and I think that's like the the traditional kind of like going off that, like they had 74 seasons in a year. If you're just going by like how to dress for the weather, you know, there's like three different winters. There's rainy, there's like there's like five different rainy seasons throughout the year scattered and they're really regular they will happen every year uh so it's not just like crazy weather like uncalled for uh but it's just best to know what you're going to experience when you're there so we want to look into that uh and dress accordingly uh oh another thing is for the summer if you don't currently or you're not planning to get like specialized like clothing for the humidity a good place to check out would be Uniqlo in Japan. It's uh, like a, a very popular clothing store. And they have a brand called Airism, which will sell like shirts and basically everything designed for the Japanese humidity. So you can buy something that will really feel a lot cooler uh, and stuff that dries out really quickly, you know, if you're getting sweaty. So yeah, the Airism at Uniqlo is a great thing to look out for. If you get there and you think, oh, maybe it's still a little too hot for what I packed. Uh, and another note on that is uh, people in the summer there use like little hand fans all of the time. So it's not weird to to use that like even on public transport or anything. Little hand like electric fans that just um, like battery operated stuff. People use them all the time because everyone knows like there's no shame in it. Everybody knows it's extremely humid. Um, you know, it's the first thing people will talk about in the summer. So uh, that's another good thing to get. And obviously... Convenience stores are everywhere, vending machines are everywhere, and that's gonna really be a lifesaver in the summer to just get a quick, you know, bottle of water, 100 yen on every street corner. So that's a really big help as well for the summer. Uh, talking about spring and fall, you know, they're obviously much more mild. Um, and, but they're also short lived. The, the peak times of spring and fall is when the leaves are changing. You wanna go for sakura season, you wanna go 
for when the leaves are turning you know, red and orange. And those are really short seasons. That's just a, a note for, for any of your future travels. But um, generally the way like Sakura blooms will work is they go from the south to the north. And you, if you followed it, you might have like a solid month of, of really nice, like, you know, perfect bloom uh, cherry blossoms. But if you're just staying in one location, it's going to feel like a weekend and it's gone. So it's really important to, to look up when the dates are like expected for a year uh, and plan accordingly for that. Uh, in terms of fashion. Right, yeah, like in the south. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And sometimes you it might get like ruined by by like an unexpectedly warm weekend, right? So that's also a thing to consider is you know, if there's generally these dates we say like, oh, from like March seventeenth until April something, it's like the perfect time. But that's for the whole country. Every like city will have a specific like weekend or, or a few days. It's like perfect. But if you're unlucky and you know it rained the day before and it was hot, then some places might just really miss out. Like if the perfect day for bloom gets rainy, all the leaves just fall off. It's just <laughs> um, so it's very like I think that's part of the the attraction to it is that it's something that lasts for such a short time. Uh, and can be so dependent on just the, the weather of that day that makes the soccer like a great experience when you when you finally get the right um, conditions for a perfect day there. Uh, in terms of fashion, it's you just have to kind of dress probably layers is the best thing. You know, it's going to be cold in the morning. It's going to be hot later on. And that's basically there um, for winter. The winters are very cold. Uh, and very dry. So you want to consider that just, you know, for keeping skin hydrate and stuff, it does get extremely dry. And that's going to be even indoors. A lot of Japanese like houses and even Japanese hotels, if you're staying at somewhere that's maybe a little bit older, is not well insulated at all. Uh, people will usually have like gas powered space heaters in these locations. And those create a terrible smell, <laughs> first of all. So you're going to get that smell stuck on all of your clothes if you go somewhere in the winter. Um, but it's going to be very cold. So like, you know, the layers, the, the like the long john, stuff like that is very important uh, for the winter because you might think like, oh, it's cold, but I just can go inside and then escape the cold. You can't escape the cold at all. There's no escaping it. Uh, so that's one of the, the key factors of winter to look out for. Oh, yes. So, yeah, people say that it has four seasons. So that's a little misleading because they really have uh, a lot more and you could you could dress for one kind of season but if it's you know if you if you catch the wrong weekend or the wrong few days that you're there you're going to feel like you prepared wrongly even though you dress for like spring or summer or something like that so it's important to uh, to look ahead for that and I will make sure that you guys aren't going during typhoon season and if you are advise for different clothing there Let's see. Right. Okay. You'll be fine. I've read through typhoon season and the Philippines. Looks great. Just everything kind of everything gets closed is the big unfortunate part there. It's just people they really they've closed things down. So it, it'll look things will start looking abandoned like when a hurricane's coming, like boarded up, just ready for the typhoon. So best not to make any plans around that time. Like the Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And let's see. Hmm. So going to shopping, this is uh, a lot more like vocabulary and stuff that we can use when shopping. Oh, uh, does anyone, did anyone think of an idea of what they want to buy uh, in Japan? Anything just off the top of your head that you're like, I definitely want to get this. Uh, and we can kind of figure out where is the best place to buy it and stuff like that. Does anyone have any ideas? Yeah. A wind chime. Ooh. That's very nice. And summer's perfect time for that. Probably the best place to look is in Kyoto. I think that's where you're gonna find. Um, because usually they're they're handmade and it's like a bit more artisan. So you'll find that like ceramic and, and glass um shops, like specialty shops in in Kyoto. 
And sometimes it can be a bit pricey. But what I noticed is if you go around to where you think like that, the kind of more like the souvenir kind of area it would be, uh, you can look around at shops. And even if it's like a very expensive looking shop, like the inside just looks so glamorous. If you look around enough, you might find one that has their clearance section in front and it's still incredibly high quality stuff. It looks amazing. Uh, and it'll be like a 10th of the price of what they're selling like in the displays of the store. So that's a good thing to look out for in Kyoto. I've bought a lot of gifts for my family that way, just looking and being like, I could get my dad this $250 cup. I could get one for $20 and it still looks great. <laughs> um, so that's a good good note there. Yes. Music box, like the, the turn ones. Mm. That's interesting. I don't. <laughs> Probably Kyoto as well. They they do that's you know like a more traditional kind of craft like artists and stuff. I think Kyoto. Mm, there might be places in Tokyo that you can find that. I don't know what kind of store you would buy a music box. In. Yeah, maybe. Because that's where we that's where we've always found. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. <clears throat> Mm. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. It's a little bit easier to find it there. <laughs> right. I, I wonder if it'll be as common in Japan, but I'll look into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's an idea. <laughs> yeah that is a good note if you buy something that's really big like if you decide oh let's go to a japanese arcade and do the claw machine and you win some giant pikachu uh the shipping is generally very good in japan so you either ship it to uh, another location you're going you know you're going to be at and kind of take care of it then or you could just ship it home and it might be expensive but if it's something big and light <laughs> like a plushie like something like that um, or you know, clothing or something that's not too incredibly dense. Uh, shipping should probably be a very easy way. Like it'll be easy to set up, and you can even ask hotels to do it for you. Um, that's another thing. People often will use hotels to ship their like bags to their next hotel, so that they don't have to carry it around like on Shinkansen and stuff. Yeah. yeah. That's what. That's what. That's what. Smart. <laughs> Um, right, I would probably say Kyoto for that as well, and you will be able to find um, some some really good stuff, and hopefully, like I said, find something that's not. So, if you really want to stock up on like a lot of small things, looking for those little, um, you know, and they'll they'll have big yellow and red everywhere, and you'll know it's a sale, and that's a great place to find little gifts. Yeah. Ooh. I think. It's, I think it's not that hard to buy. They're just very expensive. Yeah. And you'd have to ship it home. Yes. I've, I've heard a lot of stories of people getting all the way to the airport uh, with their, you know, $500 katana. And even if it's not sharp, they're like, you are not taking that on a plane. So shipping it. Uh, and definitely expensive. The, uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. I think Kyoto is definitely going to be the place to look for all of that. I think it, there's a chance you might be able to find shops that do that in like Tokyo. But when it comes to just being able to find it easily, you're going to see it walking down the street in Kyoto, especially in the older areas of the city, like um, 
I believe Gion is a good place to look. Well, anywhere near the river uh, in Kyoto is the place to look for uh, for like authentic kind of Japanese traditional stuff. Yeah, in terms of the katana, might be hard. I know some places do have like wooden swords, which are just as good, like kendo swords, which look very cool, even though they're not, you know, fully ornate like that. Um, <laughs> you, like even in my little town, I would walk down the street and there was a place like a shop that sold those like huge um, knives they use for carving up uh, like tuna, like knives, like two meters long or something. Uh, they'd have different parts of katana so you could buy like the would be like the hilt or the the hand guard part and that's very ornate uh uh they i don't think they sold just the handle and i saw that they did sell just blades as well so you might be able to like you know find a, a sword shop something like that that has very adjacent things if you can't get the whole katana um i think that's a good one the uh the the hand guard is like one of the more impressive parts of a katana when when they put it all together you know the blade is 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 handmade and, and done the handle but also the guard is like the smallest thing that's easy to get i think yeah <laughs> look out for that one okay right so yeah if you're looking for very traditional japanese things you'll definitely be able to find them in kyoto other things like um something more contemporary japanese like like anime stuff in that uh tokyo Will be the place to look uh like akihabara and odaiba probably okay uh so under shopping we have a few things <laughs> yeah Every single oh my goodness yeah no <laughs> luckily like my experience with japanese airports is that their security is very just quick it's like in, yeah that's awesome yeah. <laughs> yeah something to plan ahead mm. they do uh, like i think I'm even in in Kyoto, I've seen a lot of things where it's like a, like a ton of keychain and stuff like that. Like they they do sell a lot of souvenirs for it, so there's definitely going to be something to like look out for. I just need some earrings to get them. They're empty earrings this past summer, mm. and it took me until like a month ago to go. Oh my god, I never got out in the building. I I buy earrings. Mm -hmm. Everything you should find the earrings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you were you were you were welcome. Let me see those are very big yeah okay yeah so we've got phrases to know um phrases uh like how did you go about payments and then responses so any follow-up questions you might get that's a a pain point for a lot of people learning the language is you might know how to ask what you want but you don't know what they're asking you afterwards <laughs> so that's uh, important to know uh and then some notes about the money uh and i just realized i forgot to bring my japanese money but i have pictures and i'll explain it to you <laughs> Uh, and I, I had it right there and I just walked right past it. Okay, so going into yeah. phrases to know. First, very important one is going to be sumimasen. And it's also the first one on your uh, worksheet if you want to fill it in there. So uh, sumimasen is excuse me, and you can use it uh, in a lot of situations. It's very versatile. So, you know, walking through a crowd, excuse me, sumimasen, sumimasen. Uh, if you think you've made some kind of mistake or faux pas, Sumimasen goes a long way to, to, you know, it's excuse me, it's I'm sorry. And if you're in a store or if you're in a restaurant, you want to get someone's attention, you can just say out loud, Sumimasen. And usually that'll be enough for someone to turn and look. Uh, and my experience has been, if you just say it loudly into the air, someone will take notice and, and come get you. So um, it's good, you know, if, if you, said excuse me in english some people might understand that the way they say excuse me like the way in, the, in like the japanese accent it's more like excuse me so it's a little bit different if you just say like, excuse me they won't know what you're saying <laughs> so sumimasen is really helpful Su yes i think it goes like sumimasen yeah sumimasen 
like the lady said, you know, last reading. It is, but there's okay. Yeah, it it's the emphasis is it's really difficult because people say Japanese is flat, but and there's this this joke um from a a YouTuber who does like a lot of higher level Japanese grammar um explanations. He says like Japanese is furato, like furato, because when you say it, it does have emphasis, mm -hmm. and it's not so much. Well, I guess it is the same thing as emphasis, but yeah, one syllable will go higher or lower or it'll have downward pitch or upward pitch. So that's a, a, a pain point um, to pay attention to. But if you say it all equally and loud, you'll get the point across. <laughs> so just sumimasen like that. And in Japanese, a lot of vowels just kind of disappear. So if you just say like, you know, you might hear it a lot in stories, you might hear it be like, sumimasen, like just really quickly, but um, it's really common. Oh yeah, sumimasen. So <laughs> yeah, right. Even the M disappears. Like sumimasen. Yeah, but sumimasen. Like that. Yeah, right. Yeah, it just a lot of like the M's might get cut off. The eyes. Uh, that's just kind of how it goes when you're when you're speaking it at speed. Um, but it works in those situations, obviously. So you can usually get some attention if you bump into someone. Uh, sumimasen and stuff like that. Yes. Right. Some of it is is the emphasis, and some of it is just pronouncing the vowels differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. They don't put the s in there, but yeah, it's Nishin or Nissan. Like Nissan, we say Nissan. It's supposed to be like Nis Nissan. It's a long s, which is weird. Nissan. Uh, well, yeah, right, yeah. Um, I don't know how to say Hyundai because it's Korean, right? So they say like Hyundai or Hyundai. Like it's just, and people in England say it differently. It's all very confusing. <laughs> yeah, so getting it exactly right uh, it takes practice uh, and experience of listening, um, which is, once you start learning these words, if you're watching Japanese media, like, music and, and anime and shows, you will start to be able to hear them more. And then you, you'll, you'll be experiencing what it's actually sounding like from, from a native speaker. So that helps a lot. It helps a lot, yeah. Just to have a feeling for how the sound hits your ears, where it's not just a bunch of gibberish. Uh, and eventually, you know, you get to the point where you've heard enough of the basic kind of words and read them right on, like, in line. That you can kind of just listen to anime and kind of know what's going on, uh, which is a nice little thing that you can develop over time. Uh, oh, okay, nice. So after sumimasen, we've got a very important phrase, how much is it, if you're asking about the price uh, of an item. So, uh, yes, it would be ikura desu ka? Ikura desu ka? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I left out the U. Right. Uh, it's it's unpronounced either way. It's silent there. It, there should be a U after the uh, S and before the K, but it's not pronounced. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. It just ends. Um, right. Yes. Uh, and here I put the uh, the last letter, the last uh, symbol there, Ka in red. Ka is the particle used to make something a question. So it's very important to include that at the end. If you said ikura desu, um, they might think you're saying this is a dolphin <laughs> because you're not asking a question. And if you say the pronunciation wrong, then you're saying ikura instead of ikura and it's a whole thing. But if you end it with a question mark, they'll know you're talking about price because you're not asking, is this a dolphin? <laughs> but you are saying, how much is it? So, ikura desu ka? The ka is very important. Uh, yeah, ikura desu ka? Mm, not there. You wouldn't have to say it there. Um, you might, you know, uh, 
just a basic conversation, a whole a, co a whole conversation could be just using these two. So sumimasen to get their attention, ikura desu ka, and they'll tell you, you know, 300 yen. And then you could say, arigato, <laughs> and then pay for it. Um, so very useful, just those two things right there. Um, oh, yes, and going on from this, it, you might be in a situation where you're not holding the thing that you're asking the price about. So uh, this and that, versions of that are very important. And they depend on the distance from the speaker and also the difference is distance from the listener uh, a bit. So if you're asking about something that, for instance, you're holding like this pen, you would say kore, which means this or this one. Kore, ikura desu ka? So you're talking about this. How much is this? Specifically, well, you don't need to do this one if it's clear what you're talking about. But for instance, if you were pointing up at a shelf or something, you know, something on a display, and you wanted to be clear, you know, let's say you know it's at a store and that mannequin's wearing a hat, a shirt, a jacket, pants, this and that, then you could point and you could say, for instance, sore, which means that, and you know, pointing plus saying that will be a much easier to understand than so how much does it cost? Yes. Or is it sorry, it could have uh, I would say put it in front. I don't think it would be incorrect to put it in the back. Um, it's not as big of a difference as how much is that or that how much is. It's not that big of a difference. Um, I would say put it in front uh, just because you're already pointing, you know, or something like that. So it, it's more clear. And for something very far away, well, very far away, for something that's not uh, close enough to hold or close enough to like point at very clearly, you would use something like are, are. So that means that, but far away. That over there, right, that over there. <laughs> so um, for instance, let's say you're at a restaurant and you see someone pull out, you know, someone comes out with a great dish and like, I want to eat that. So you might point like, are, uh, oh, you could, I think it's fine to point like that. Um, people don't like to be pointed at directly. Oh. That's like more of a, a, something that's avoided. So if someone was like in a group and you're pointing at people, you might like, like an open hand point. But I think if you were, mm -hmm. yeah, this is almost like addressing someone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yes. Try not to point your chopsticks at people too much because it's like, you know, what are you trying to do with those? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> right. So, oh, uh, another note is with, with these, with kore, sore, are, the pattern continues for different, um, uh, different pointing words. So once you know more words, like, you know, the word, oh, easily, the word for pen is pen. So if you were talking about a pen, you were talking about this pen, like, kore, uh, it would be different, kono, kono, so kono pen, kono pen, you're talking about this pen. Uh, if I'm talking about, you know, the pen now, then it's sono, sono pen. So and if, so these don't um, specify what it is you're talking about. You're saying this, that, that over there. But if you if you knew the noun to describe what you're talking about, like pen, then it would change to instead of kore, it would be kono. Instead of sore, it would be sono. Instead of are, it would be ano. Right, yeah, it would come afterwards. So, so like, you know, if I'm just saying this, kore. If I'm saying this pen, kono pen. It is pen in Japanese, yeah. <laughs> it is pen, actually. I picked that example just because it was the only word. So like, that's easily, easy to remember, pen is pen. Pen is pen. You could say that, right. Or, well, in that case, because you know it's a pen, you might say kono. We'll go over this once we get more into the language learning. But uh, if you're following along uh, in the book, chapter two covers all of it. So, uh, uh, 
Kore, Sore, Are, Kono, Sono, Ano, and you also have for uh, describing places, like here, there, over there, uh, Koko, Soko, Asoko. So chapter two of the book, very helpful for, for getting down the basics on pointing at things, asking about things. Now, just look at it because you don't have to know how to say the other thing. You don't know how to, you don't know how to, you don't have to know how to say pen, how to say pencil, how to say T set. Well, you or T would know, so. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Yeah. I think that that's good because, and then you know, just like if you were going to put it all together more fluently, uh, you just use like no a lot more to combine them because you're saying the yeah, yeah. No is like we said describes like possession, but really it's it's to make that relationship. So you could say the red, uh, like you know, cup over there. And so you just like aki no kappu, like sono aki no kappu, something like that. So it all kind of goes together. And we'll get more into that in future lessons uh, when we get into like further chapters of the book or just more detail on this next chapter. Uh, but these are really uh, helpful at the beginning is kore, sore, and are. Uh, and, and obviously, like I said, once you know more now and you know how to say the things that you're looking for in Japanese, then the no one, it like helps more, oh no. Okay. Next we have onegai shimasu, onegai shimasu. So that basically means please. It goes at the end of sentence when you're asking for something. So uh, for instance, if you're ordering food, you could point at the menu and say kore, and then you wanna say please onegai shimasu. So, kore onegai shimasu is how you might order something. And you're just saying this, please, basically. Um, I think buffets do exist. They're called biking, like biking. Yeah. Biking. Biking means buffet. Um, I think they're more like the style where you just get it yourself from my experience. Like I've gone to like um, Chinese food, the same way as here isn't as common. So the Chinese buffet isn't as popular there, but I've been to like a, like a, um, like a Korean barbecue style buffet. So you cook your own meat, but you also go and get your own. Meat. And usually they're like portioned in a bowl. So you're not touching like a whole communal thing. You're just getting what's yours. Uh, but generally for ordering, if you see a whole menu and you don't understand what it says, but you can see pictures or just kind of, if you just want to wing it, you could point kore onegai shimasu. Uh, and another good one to know is kudasai. So kudasai is uh, usually like asking for something directly, like you're asking for someone to give you something, to provide something to you, even if it's like an answer uh, to a question. So you could kind of use both interchangeably in the example of like ordering food or asking for something. You could say, kore uh, onegai shimasu, or you could say, kore kudasai. And they both kind of generally have the same level of politeness. Um, yeah, there's not a big distinction there until you get into like more advanced grammar where those, those words are hooked onto phrases where it would be weird to use the other one. But generally, if you're just saying, please, that one is, they, they're interchangeable. Onegai shimasu and kudasai. And uh, I'm writing them without any of the kanji. You might see them more often in kanji, like in signs. But if you see a sign like that, you probably won't know what the first part says to read it. <laughs> like the signs that say like, you know, entry prohibited. They might say like, you know, four kanji for that and then like kudasai and kanji at the end. You see the big red letters in the X don't go in there basically. So it's not too important to know the kanji uh, right now. Let's see. Oh, and another thing is, uh, even if you get lucky and you don't have to 
like like you'll get a lot of English speakers or something and you don't have to interact that much and ask these questions in Japanese. It is still helpful to learn these uh, for when the unexpected Japanese person is talking to you and you have no idea what they're saying. Because if you can pick up on a kore, a sore, an are, then you, you can kind of go, okay, wait, they're talking about this, they're talking about that, they're talking about that over there, okay. And onegaishimasu, oh, they're asking you to do something or like asking of something of me. A kudasai is, is the same, like, oh, okay, they want me to do something. So, you know, you can kind of get it. If someone just fast talks at you, but you're good aside at the end, you're like, oh, maybe I, they want me to leave here. Maybe I'm in the wrong spot. Maybe I went past the door that I wasn't supposed to go past. So they're really helpful just for listening as well to kind of get a little more context out of uh, just words flying at you. Okay. Oh, and uh, next here's a good example. So this is a picture that got big on like Japanese Twitter for a few weeks. Uh, maybe this year or last year, and people were very upset. So this is uh, like a hot food thing in a convenience store, and the sign there says uh, no kyakusama e kore," and I think that's supposed to be a, a picture of a finger pointing, uh, and then it says "kore kinshi uh, nikuman kudasai te ite. So it says to foreign customers, it is forbidden to say kore, to say this, and to point at the food they mean. And they say, please say, or they don't say please, they say, say pork bun, please. Um, right, they, but it's, as you can see, it's all in Japanese. So nobody understands it. People were, people, foreigners and, and Japanese people outraged at this. They're like, what is the point? You're really just calling out foreigners for not understanding Japanese in a way that's completely in Japanese. Everybody was very upset at this. And the general consensus was Japanese people do it too, all of the time. If you're in a convenience store, you want to be convenient, you want to be fast. So you walk in, you hand them the thing, you say kore, and they get it for you. And it's usually supposed to be a seamless like mm -hmm. interaction, yeah, transaction. Uh, so even though this is a sign that got very popular, you really don't have to worry about this. People don't expect you to know Japanese, to know how to say meat bun and then how to ask for it politely. And Japanese people do it all the time. Pop Japanese people will say kore, kudasai, kore onegaishimasu, and that's it. So I just want to bring this up. Some people might think like, oh, is that enough to know how to order something? Yes, it is. You really don't have to worry about this. This was one um, shopkeeper in, I think, Nagoya who just got really mad at foreign customers do your job, you know? <laughs> if you work at a convenience store, you're gonna get people that say, can I have that? Like, it's just gonna happen. <laughs> so, it, you know, it, it came up, it was talked about a lot, but it's not gonna be a problem. So kore, onegaishimasu, kore kudasai, totally fine. Not something to worry about, as long as you don't run into this guy, you know, on a bad day. <laughs> uh, if you're asking for one of these, like like a like a meat bun, it would be nikuman. Nikuman, so niku is pork and man is bun. Generally, if you're talking about the hair bun, it's called dango instead. It's not bun. But it's not man. Um, so man, like man, man, man. M A N, I believe it's it. It's used for bun. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's the the yeah the brand. But mm. right. See, the problem here is that these aren't all just straight up meat buns, uh, uh, niku, N-I-K-U, niku, nikuman, yeah, nikuman, yeah, yeah, oh, they're so good, they are so good, but um, the thing here is, these buns all have really long names, because they're not just, like, pork buns, this one is pork, tomato, and cheese, this one is uh, what is it? Curry, pork curry bun. This one is a pizza bun. <laughs> this one is a sweet red bean paste bun. So you could, like, obviously, if a foreign customer comes in, they don't know the six different, like, store brand names for these buns. They're just going to point at this one. This one, please. Uh, no, they're not. They're all they're all different. So there's pork buns. There. So this one's pork cheese and tomato bun. The other one is what did i say it's uh yes pork curry bun or beef no that's beef curry beef curry bun 
pizza bun, sweet bun, everything. So, right. And the names, as you can see here, they're all in Japanese. I think this one, this one at the top, it does say it in, uh, in English, and, but the other ones don't. So really, you have no choice but to say Kone, and the staff should definitely be okay with it. Uh, and they will be, unless you get this guy in a bad mood. So, um, but they're very good. I recommend them. Right? Maybe it wasn't an argument. If you can imagine, you know, if he's in a bad mood, he gives you one, you're like, oh, not this one. He's like, I already took it out. <laughs> I already put the thing in. I'm not changing, you know, just a guy in a bad mood, really. Um, but it, it was a big deal on Twitter. Uh, yeah, right? <laughs> I'm not complaining. <laughs> right. But generally, you know, regardless of this, saying kore kudasai, kore onegaishimasu, totally fine. Yeah. Uh, but, oh, and on this note, this is a good kanji to know, just to kind of generally recognize. You will usually see it in red. Uh, and even though it's handwritten, it's generally close to that. It looks like, what's the kanji for tree? So it's like two trees and then another tree. And then it, it's hard to remember it. But and then this one's very common. It means prohibited or forbidden. So you'll see it, you know, like you might see that sign in like in red letters, it'll be like, can't park here, can't put your bike here, do not enter. You'll see that one a lot. I so just generally. About to say something about the painting finger. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're uh, they're not an artist, but <laughs> it just it's just not even close to a finger, really, is the <laughs> right. Which we have already found. But fair enough, it's 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 clearly hastily put together. They couldn't even space it out to put everything like on the same line, like which is so yeah. Yes, it's pronounced uh kinchi. If you want to look it up later. Kin kinchi, K-I-N-S-H-I. Wait. Let me make sure. Yeah, kinchi. <laughs> it looks like a cartoon finger with only three hands, really. Your three fingers, right? Right, it's a Simpson. Okay. Moving on. Okay. So for payment, let's say you've picked your pork bun and you're ready to buy it. And you're not an angry shop. Right. You got a good guy. You got a, a nice person. Uh, so it does depend uh, on the shop. Different shops have different styles. So they're. There's a lot of different styles. For example, ramen restaurants kind of commonly have a um, a ticket kind of machine or like a vending machine. So you go up and they'll have the menu and they'll have a vending machine with like the numbers one through however many things on the menu. And you just look at what you want on the like picture of the menu and you click it and it'll give you a ticket which you take and hand to the chef or the server and they bring you food. So that's where you kind of pay uh, before the meal generally. So is it true cash? Cash is right, cash is king most of the time. Like for example, at those vending machines, I've only ever seen cash vending machines. So you are going to need it. So you know, like a ramen shop, very little chance that they'll take credit cards. Um, there's also like a restaurant, like you might imagine, where you order a thing and then pay at the end. There's some where you pay, where you order everything on a tablet. So then there's either a button on the tablet, or you have to ask the person to bring you a seat, which you pay in front. And they kind of follow a trend. So like sushi restaurants will uh like the conveyor belt sushi ones will have that where you order on the tablet and then the person brings you just like a barcode receipt and you pay that at the machine in front um like i said the ticket the ticket machine ones or the style where you just pay at the end like you might expect um, but those are just things to look out for and you'll notice like different ones uh so when if it comes to the time where you actually have to ask for the bill so it's not the ticket machine where you pay ahead and it's not uh, another one. When you want them to bring you the bill, you would say, okay, K, okay, K, K is fine, K. You can say it like the letter K, because it's K E I, K. Okay, K, onegai shimasu. Basically, yes. Uh, and that that will be their cue to bring you the bill. That's. That's, that'll be the result of that one. So it's very helpful. Um, let's see. The next one.
Oh, did I note here? Right. Uh, oh, yeah, so they might ask you how you want to be paying. Uh, that is a hard question to hear. But if you look at them and you're like, what did you just ask me? They'll be like, cash card. And the words for that are for cash, it's genkin. Genkin. Kin. Yeah, K I N, kin. Right, kin, like, like I'm kin, yeah. Genkin. Genkin. The N there is very important. Genkin. Uh, if you said genki, that means like energetic. Totally inappropriate for such a thing. How would you like to pay? A smile, like no. <laughs> so genkin. <laughs> yeah, you can't smile your way out of the bill. So genkin with the N is very important there. Uh, card is easier to remember. It's kado. Kado. So the R just kind of gets lost into a long A. Yeah, yeah. This is a borrowed word for sure. Kado. Uh, card. Right, God. credit card. Yeah. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, you won't see anywhere that you have to say credit card. It's it follows the same pattern. It's just credito cardo. No need. Cardo works. Cardo. So cardo. Um, and depending on where you are, you will be able to use cards like at a convenience store. If you have a card that can be used internationally, uh, you might have luck there. Some convenience stores, like in major cities, are, are very easy. Well, where um, you'll be able to just, there'll be a big screen where you can select your payment type. And it says it in Japanese, in English, in Chinese, and Korean. Like, it just says everything. So very easy experience there. Uh, but if you're asked, Kago. Uh, and I'll make a note so we can learn how to say, like, is card OK? something that you might be asking about. Generally, it's just best to carry cash because that's what's going to be expected most of the time. Uh, but I'll make a note for that. Just if you want to ask, like, can I pay with the bar? Yes. I have never had blood work with the uh, like at the, I don't know if they didn't like my card, or I was always using them after they had like shut down, which why doesn't make time machine shut down? That's interesting, but <laughs> I think so. I think they like will have like business hours, yeah. even if the, the convenience store is 24 hours, they'll be like, Oh, that's only open eight to eight or something like that. It might have been that every time I wanted my business, it was like after business hours, but um, a bit of a gamble. Yeah, but if they're about to go out for a whole day, it's that right. okay. But then it comes down to how much do you know? Oh, generally, it doesn't really matter. You can use the, the largest domination, and because everything is so cash based, it's not like they'll have an empty till. They're ready for that. Yeah. So it's not like walking in with a little hundred dollar bill. <laughs> no, no, because well, imagine if everybody paid cash all the time at Croker, they would be flush with cash, right? They would never run out okay. of bills. So that's really something you don't have to worry about is if you just, like I would just do that all the time. I would only take my money in large bills and then just break down and I go. It's easiest if you forget cards exist and you just have a lot of cash. And, To just use cash all the time. Mm. <laughs> it's helpful. It's helpful. Um, like when you can, when you can, uh, when a place will accept it. And it's not like it's an extra complicated step. Like it's not going to like take longer. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, and you know, just uh, there's like, like I think the biggest thing is there's gonna be a lot of coins because no matter what you do, like they're not gonna give you coin bars and stuff like that all the time. You're gonna have a lot of coins for that. Uh, and I have that in the next section, but I definitely recommend having a little coin first. But you, you can also buy all of these same coins across all the different components. Yes. yes. It's okay. So now I think it can be easier. Mm -hmm. Wait, that's a oh my god. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, and I'll show you uh, coming up what that looks like so it's kind of easy to recognize. Oh, uh, last one you've kind of paid. Uh, if you want to say thank you, it's just different depending on restaurant store, at a store, arigato, arigato gozaimasu, perfectly fine. Uh, you don't have to, it's just extra polite. Um, so, arigato gozaimasu. It, it doesn't have to be, it could be. Usually, you would want to combine it like as much as possible. So, go zai, ai zai, go zai. Go zai. They just ended there, right? Go zai. Yeah, it is just like that. Yes. Uh, so, arigato gozaimasu at a store. And if you are at a restaurant, I think we've talked about this before, but the gochiso sama deshita. Gochiso sama deshita. Yeah, it's a very long one. So it's um probably, yeah, three times. Like if you go gochiso, it's like thank you for the meal or um, I, thank you for the meal is a good way to say it. So. Uh, and it doesn't matter if you're talking to the person who cooked it, the person who brought it to you. If you're at a restaurant and you're leaving, everybody's happy with that. Yes. <laughs> yes, so you could say it at the end of a meal, um, but it's also very normal to say it when you're leaving a restaurant. So, right. The the sticking point there is that if you leave a restaurant and you say arigato gozaimasu, that is really to say that is normal. So if you like, you know, you just had a great meal, walk out, you just go, I got the like, that's yeah. So you say because it's having to do with food and you've received it and you've accepted it, but you saw sama de shita. But you saw sama de shita. The good thing is, you know, if you spend one day in Japan, you will have heard all of these phrases a million times. So you'll pick up very quickly and just be able to copy exactly how you're hearing it, uh, you know, in person, which is helpful. Especially at a restaurant, people always say "go so summer stuff." Okay, and next, oh, next we have responses. Or, um, so, some follow-up questions you might get. You might get, "Do you want a bag? Do you need a bag?" Um, like at a convenience store, if you only buy a few things, or even if you buy a lot, they'll ask you, "Do you want a bag with that? Like, would you like a bag?" Um, I think now there is like a three yen, like a three cent fee for plastic bags and stuff. But uh, the important, the most important part is this: this word really for bag. So word for bag is fukudo. Fukudo. Um, and convenience stores, people are very like um, accommodating. If you go there and you look at them, like I don't know what you just said. They will reach on the counter and pull up a bag and be like, this? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's usually you'll have a lot of luck. Yeah. Um, with people helping you out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is there a kanji for this word? Yes. And there is a different kanji for the same word. Yes. I think it also means owl, maybe. So there's, yeah, kanji. kanji. Kanji won't always help you. Uh, well, it will always help you, but you won't always help you. So. Well, you can't Right. Yeah. Um, that's why I say it's a high context language. You need a lot of context to get your point across when all the words kind of sound the same or are exactly the same. That's like I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah, that's a tongue twister. Yes, the um, niwa 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 tori des. Yeah, is how you say it. there are two chickens in the garden. But that those, all those things mean the same thing. So if you're talking about chickens, it's niwa tori. If you're talking about garden, it's niwa. If you're saying something is in, you say niwa, and two is niwa. 
So if you say that's a it's a Japanese tongue twister, niwa 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 tori des. There are two chickens in the room. <laughs> There's a lot of those. People love tongue twisters in Japan. So if you're if you're talking with a Japanese person, that's a good thing to bring up. Yeah. So yeah, some words will just be exactly the same and you won't have the context unless you you kind of are picking up with it. Um, yeah, so fukuro inimasuka is the question there that you might hear. But just listen out for fukuro and you'll know they're talking about bad. Fukuro, fukuro, so it's like a long O. Fukuro inimasuka. Yeah, vowels just love to run together in Japanese. And you'll hear ka at the end, you know, they're asking you a question. It's why it's important. It's important to know the question where it is. Yeah. Um, if you go to a convenience store, uh, you can also have like bento, like cream of the food, clean it up. Uh, and that's, that also kind of sounds funny. So it's atatame masuka. Atame masuka. At least that's distinct enough that you might be able to remember that one. Um, but if you don't, they'll usually point at like a symbol on the food that's like a microwave. And the microwave, you can just shake your head yes. But yeah. So, atafaramasuka means, would you like that heated up? Um, and you, generally, the the like pre-made meals at convenience stores are pretty good. Um, better than convenience store food here, I'll say. It's uh, low bar, but still. Uh, to try it and so for yes we have hi hi uh, and uh, a good policy is just to say that no matter what if you don't know what's going on you know you probably won't get into too many um problems if you just kind of nod and, and you get you know you get some conversation uh for no yeah 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 uh and there is like a bit of a uh, People don't like to say no directly in Japan. So uh, the, the, if the answer to the question is no, people oft, often just be like, um, that's a little, I don't know. So they don't like strong no's very often. But if the answer is just no, like, do you need a bag? No, yeah, it works fine. It's fine. It's not particularly rude to say it like that. Um, Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Uh, I think you could. It just it's a little bit like wordy. The next word is kind of perfect for that situation. Uh, and it's daijobu. Daijobu. Daijobu kind of works in a positive or a negative. It means uh like that's fine, it's okay. But obviously. So someone says, do you want a bag? You say, it's okay. And you just shake your head, no. That means it's fine, I don't want one. Uh, and if you do want a bag, it's probably best to say hi, but you could say daijobu and shake your head, yes. And no, no. So it's just, it's it's an affirmative thing, but it doesn't have to be positive. It's it's often used to say like, no, I'm fine. So yeah, yeah. And if you just go like mm, daijobu, then they no, it's no. Um, you can say no and yes in English, they probably would pick that up too. Uh, that would be very helpful. And uh, it's used very commonly, like it's, it means that you can use it in that context. It's also like, I'm fine. So if you like fall over, the people will say, Are you hurt? And you can say, Yeah, that's like, I'm fine. Don't, I'm embarrassed, but don't look like that. So that's very helpful. That's okay. I'm fine. And then you just use your kind of body language to, you know, no. So that's useful in that. Like, no thanks, Daijobu works. And uh, oh, the last phrase, very important. I don't understand. Uh, so, Wakari Nisen. Wakari Nisen. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, the, the Masen is is uh, the negative conjugation of that. Uh, like, if you change it and you say Wakari Masu, then you do understand. Uh, which I guess is useful for some situations, but wakari masen is very helpful. And it'll, usually people will, you know, they're not just going to give up and go, like, ah, I guess you don't need anything. They'll try to work with your body language and context clues to 
Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's true. If you're sitting at a cash register and they just say a bunch of words and you say wakarimasen, they'll be like, okay, let's take a few steps back <laughs> and and go no, slowly. Uh, but that's very helpful. Wakarimasen gets you through a lot of situations. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, those are both getting into like very casual speak. So if you do understand, you could say wakata. Wakata. Yeah, basically the important part is the waka, which means understand, and then it's conjugated in many different ways. So wakata is like the past tense, so it's like saying understood. Um a very casual way to say I don't understand is wakaran. Because it's a, a short version of wakaranine, which like means I don't have understanding. <laughs> and you can just shorten that like wakaran. It's very casual. I'd be surprised. Um, I think people would be surprised to hear you say that if you're just like a first time visitor. Yeah. Yes, yeah. If, if you said wakaran, they might think you're more fluent than you are, and then explain in a way that still uses Japanese. So, you, you know, it's a, it's sometimes at your detriment to be casual because they'll assume you're better at the language than you are to have that level of, of casual, casuality. Mm, I think yeah, in that context, it's kind of like using slang politely. <laughs> right, yeah. So it's, right. The the mass is, is added to be like, I'm still using a fully formed sentence. Uh, so it's like saying, oh, I understand, you know, if someone's telling you to do something, instead of just saying, got it. <laughs> it's kind of a difference there. Um, and that is something that you will kind of learn further into speaking Japanese is when you can be casual and when you should be like the most formal and then also when you can mix them. And mixing them is kind of like, that's the mastery. That's when you can, when you're really good is when you're just speaking, uh, you know, every which way, every conjugation. It's kind of like English. You know? Once you can use things incorrectly in the right place, then you become a few English. Okay, next we have the money. So this is what the money looks like. And I, I really wish I had brought them with me, but the bills, they're all the same size, and there's four of them, but they're bigger than American dollars. They're taller. So if you have like like a folding wallet that exactly fits a dollar well, it might be sticking up. That happens when I have a normal fold wallet, my money sticks up the top like a third of a centimeter because it's bigger than a dollar. Right, yeah. A lot of people will just like fold it up a lot, which is fine. Japanese people often don't fold their money many times. They like to hand it over like very flat with as few creases as possible. Um, but yes, these are bigger than a dollar, like dollar wise. So just you know if you're carrying a lot, you know, you're gonna have stuff sticking out. So there's 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000. And the 2,000, is very rare. I don't think I've ever seen a 2000 in the wild. So they just really don't use it that much. Lucky day. It's, it's honestly, it's like a $2 bill. It's like finding a $2 bill, really. Like that's, yeah. Yeah. Like I, I really don't think I've ever seen a 2000 yen bill. So they're they're pretty rare. Um, but that makes it easier because then you're just in with one, five, or 10, uh, or $10. $50, one hundred dollars, roughly. Yeah. The, uh, the place you're most likely to find just like loose change is in the uh, the change slot of a vending machine. Sometimes people will just let it fall and forget about it. Knock off. You know, if you're in a real rush. Put in a five hundred buy a one hundred yen drink bill. Well, you might get you know a new payday there, nine four dollars, which is a lot. Yeah. Yes, and people do carry a lot of cash with them. Like some people will buy houses and cars fully in cash. So you can imagine if you're doing only hundred dollar bills, that's going to be a lot. And there's been stories of people leaving 
an entire down payment on it that's just on the train, you know, they got off and they get it back. So you don't have to worry about losing your money very much. Japan has a strong culture of returning lost items, even if it is money. Oh yeah, so there's the, the first one uh, is the, the yen symbol that we use. The second one is the kanji for yen, which you might also see, but it's just helpful to know both in case you see a price that has that second symbol and you're like, well, it's just a bunch of numbers and then a symbol I don't understand. That means yen also. Um, the use of them, it's it's it depends. It's really hard to know which one you'll see, but there's two symbols for yen. They have the same value. It's just knowing which, like, knowing that they're both the same thing so you don't get too confused. Right, and they don't use the y and yen when speaking. So if they're telling you the price something, they'll just say n. Mm. So, you know, this one is like a thousand yen, it's sen en, sen en, and then like even one yen, ichi yen. And that, that sounds like it has a Y, but only because it starts with an I at the end of ichi, so ichi yen. Uh, the nice thing about these, the coins are very easy to distinguish. Um, so the one yen coin is tiny. And extremely light. So it's so light that you could put it on top of water and it won't break the surface tension. They float on top of water. Like a paper lid. Yeah. So you'll see that in like temples, people will often, like if there's a big rain collecting thing, you could put, like carefully put a one yen coin on it and they float on the surface. So that that's really easy to feel around in the coin first because it's just floating. Like it's so light. Uh, the five and the 50 both have circles in them. So if you're looking for a denomination of five, you can kind of feel. You see a circle, okay, now you know you're holding a five. Right. Yeah, I think I think the color also has to do with that. Like they used to be like a bronze and a silver, and that's why and they used to put them like that. So the five and the fifty are kind of more traditional like that. The five hundred is really big and really shiny, so that's easy to find as well. Person, you didn't start bringing these, and I didn't. I was like, I can't see which one's which. I'm sorry. Yes. You figured out that. These are these are a lot easier, and like as you can see, for the one, the ten, the hundred, and the five hundred, the numbers are really big on them. Like it's just that's all it says on the front, basically. Yeah. And a five hundred yen coin is so satisfying. It's like. It's like a like a like a silver dollar. Like it's big, it's heavy, and they're easy to find. I like holding on to them. Right. Yeah. And then the one hundred yen, very common. It's smaller. It's around the same as the, the ten yen. So these are the same size, but different colors. Same as the same size, different colors. So it kind of helps. And then you can see the difference in the color. Which one has the higher value? Yeah. So would you get in trouble for finding the five hundred yen? I don't. Think so. I think like generally the Japanese thing to do would be to return it. But if you find it like on the floor of a vending machine, who do you return it to? You know, um, if you see it under someone's chair, you might feel like, hey, is that yours? You know, same as money anywhere. Um, if you find a wallet full of thousand, ten thousand yen uh, bills, like on the train or something. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, you can leave it and it'll probably be fine, or you could return it to like, you can give it to a station staff, and they're very good about getting it back to you. So that's, that's a nice feature. So you don't have to worry too much if you, you know, lose your wallet, just trace your steps. Someone will have probably already turned it on, uh, which is really nice. I think I've even heard of someone like putting a bait wallet on a train. They're like, we're going to put, you know, $50 in 1,000 yen, leave it there, let it go around the entire circuit, and it came back to them with more money. <laughs> so that's even generosity. Someone's like, ooh, poor guy, like a little more in. <laughs> so yeah, generally worrying about losing your money isn't such a big deal in Japan, which is nice. And then there's an oyster card. Yes, the cards are also very helpful because um, you can pay like at a vending machine. It totally replaces meaning all this, but I would still recommend like a coin purse and a, a larger than dollar wallet for these things. So, so that's something we have to add to our, our, our shopping list. Because this one, you forget the purse and all these clothes. Yeah. Yes. Have a good coin purse that you know, 
I think I got mine that I used for two years straight at like a Daiso for two dollars something like that. Yeah. So Daiso is a good place for just cheap stuff. Uh, you could get like more traditional ones made out of nice fabric in Kyoto. I got that as a gift for my family before. Uh, and those are generally really cheap. Like coin purses are not expensive, uh, even if they look nicer. And you will find them all over the place. You might go into a convenience store and just see like a, a something like that. Like I think even like uh, at the Pokemon Center like stores, you can find like Pokemon themed coin purses. So there's there's one for everything. Yeah, you'll you'll find a coin purse that you like, and you know you might get one, and you might get another one. Just get both; they're so cheap. So that's really helpful. If you have to buy water, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. If they prefer to use gold, are the coin purses buying gold? people will have like a billfold for for that stuff. Like, well, is it even a billfold if it doesn't fold the bill? But yeah, like. Like a um, I mean, people don't keep cash in their coin purse generally, just the actual coins. But oh yeah, generally you'll find that like it's very common. I guess the same as your like a like one that could probably fit like a common like, 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 something like that. Um, it's common. I guess probably something that you can find in America, right? Is if you put like a dollar in it. And you see if there's a good amount of space above that dollar, you'll be fine. If it's like the zipper's right on the dollar, you're going to rip the top of your back here again. Um, yeah, I should have really brought mine, but it's probably not much bigger than like this, per se. Probably smaller, even. Um, I think like probably just the whole front. Like probably about that big? Yeah. Because that does not fit. <laughs> yeah, I would say probably without, without the case is kind of what you're looking at there. Um, yeah, I'll oh I'll bring some for next lesson actually just because I I have I only have the ten thousand yen because that's like the money that's left over when I emptied my bank account. I only have big things, but for the same size, I'll bring that for reference next time. Um, okay, so that's the money, and I think that is. Everything, yeah, that's all I've got. So uh, as notes, yeah, the Genki PDF is very useful if you want to go over what we've learned kind of language-wise so far. You're looking at the first two chapters of Genki, uh, which is the textbook. Uh, and they've got examples so you can practice, so you can get familiar. Uh, and I'll find some resources for the um, listening activities and stuff. So you can also listen if you want to, to practice more. Yeah. Yes, that's a good note. I think I wrote that down and didn't mention it. Yeah. Right. Generally, you don't hand money directly to someone. Uh, and the convenient part of that is, is that there will be like a usually blue, green, something like that tray that's always right in front of you at the cash register. And you just put your money there. Even if it's card, coin, anything, you put it there. And it's very easy. They like people will be very used to handling money through the tray, and they might not want to like receive money directly in your hand. But um, you know, if someone's paying in a bunch of bills and coins, it's actually easier for them to just have it on the tray. They can and then pour out the coins. And, yeah. So the tray is very helpful. Uh, you might also see like at convenience stores that have been renovated, they'll just have like uh, it would kind of look like an ATM, like a little slot, put all the bills in all at once, and then pour in the coins. Um, but yeah, generally you don't want to hand it directly to someone unless there is no tray, but if there's a tray, that's where you want to put it. Yeah. Uh, what else you have? Oh yeah. The first two chapters are, are what we've covered so far. Um, good to keep practicing that and the numbers, Hidagana, Katakana, and the numbers is helpful for once you're listening to prices. So if someone, you know, says, if you say, and then you say, Sen yen. That means one thousand two hundred yen, uh, twelve hundred yen. So it's helpful. The numbers are really helpful for when you're going to be buying things, so you know what you're listening to. Um, I'm trying to remember. I think the 
the picture of the meat buns will tell us. Yeah, I think it's plus tax already. So that is one thirty eight yen is the price. Yeah. I think generally, I think other things won't say tax, but I think what I'm thinking of now is like at the convenience store, the um, like the wine section, all that will have an extra tax because it's a tax wine. So that doesn't say it, yeah. Um, but it will it will say it on there. It'll be another number below it. So if you see this, whatever price you see is the price it's going to be. And if there's another number under that, it's telling you what the tax is already. But it's all generally up front. You're not gonna like pay more after that. Uh, I think so, but I'll write that down just to confirm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think that's all I've got. Newsletters just to um, see what we've covered so far and all the extra stuff that I've mentioned. And with that, uh, like take a look at all that and if you have any like remaining big questions obviously we've got the um the index cards to write on but i think next time since it's going to be our last one for the break uh i'll plan some some nice like uh activities or something we can do and also answer any like big outstanding questions uh before the break okay so thanks